All right, Psalm 100 is a very familiar passage of Scripture, and just about every Thanksgiving, somebody will preach on this particular psalm, but I didn't know of any better psalm to use than this one. Notice the words of God. The Bible says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Then it tells us why. For the Lord is good. That's why we ought to bless his name. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Father, we thank you so much for the reading of your precious word. Now I pray you'll take this vessel of clay that I yield to you, and Lord, that you might just anoint it from on high. Fill it with the precious Holy Ghost that you might speak through this vessel words that will not only feed our soul, but Lord, fill us so full that we cannot help but to go out into a lost, uncaring, and dying world and spill over that others may see Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. A good question to begin a message like this uh, with would be the question, what do you think when you think of Thanksgiving? Well, there would be those who would answer that question by saying, bless God, I think about eating. Amen. And uh, if you're an American, that's just about what we all think about, eating. Uh, well, whenever I think about Thanksgiving, I think about football. Going to be some good football games on. Well, preacher, when I think about Thanksgiving, I just praise God, I'm going to have a long weekend. And then there'll be those that'll say, I can't wait till we get through eating and they open up all them stores and we can go to those Black Friday sales. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Then somebody will say, uh, history. I think about history. Well, I do think about history. I think about uh, the first pilgrims, and I think about family thanksgivings that we've had in the past around my granny's table. I think about thanksgiving we've had in our home and uh, the empty places that, uh, where there's nobody there anymore. There was a time that uh, Papa Preta was sitting around that table, Several years ago, there was times that my mother was sitting around that table, but now they're sitting around the Lord's table. Uh, and, and what better table to be sitting around? Uh, so we think about family. But Thanksgiving is much more than any of this. Uh, you know, a true Thanksgiving is not just a day for food and football and family. It's not just a holiday that we celebrate the fourth Thursday of November for God's people every day, hear me, every day ought to be Thanksgiving Day. Amen. In this particular psalm, you'll find five key words, five key words that describe the essence of Thanksgiving. And that's what I've titled the message today. Five keys to giving thanks. The first key is this. And the first word is this, number one, joy. God wants for you and I to have a joyful heart. Now, we live in a world where joy can be stolen away. The Bible says that Satan, like a roaring lion, walketh about seeking those in whom he may devour. And you need to understand that he'll do that. He'll devour you if you let him do that. Now the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it is. And uh, the devil just don't like it when you have a joyful heart. And he wants to steal that away from you. I like the way this psalm begins. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. You know, years ago I used to try to sing just a little bit. And... Uh, I can't so much sing anymore because over the years, uh, I, I tell everybody, my preaching voice has affected my singing voice. And many years ago at Holt Baptist Church, we had a 
little short lady who attended church there, and uh, I always called her Miss Veal. And my best friend uh, in that particular church was Joy Veal. I always called him my deacon. And uh, it was Brother Joy's mother. And so I sing a special one night, and uh, I always sing that special at night because we didn't have as many people at night as we did during the day. And so I didn't persecute so many saints that way. You know what I mean? And so I got up and I sang the special that night, and she met me at the back door, and she was a little short lady. She just looked up into my face and shook her head. And I looked at her and I said, what? I said, the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You know what she said? But preacher, that was a terrible racket. <laughs> that was a terrible racket. I said, what's terrible as a racket to you may be joyful to the Lord. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Now listen to me. We don't have a bit of problem shouting and screaming our lungs out at a ball game. I raised two boys that played sports. We got a daughter that played softball. And, uh, you know, I can remember going to games, and I can remember screaming until I was hoarse. Didn't even know how I'd be able to preach unless God restored my voice. Screaming to the top of my lungs at a ball game. We don't have a problem shouting at a ball game, but we can't even say hallelujah or praise the Lord inside the church. If somebody does that, somebody will look at them like, what in the world's wrong with you? What in the world's wrong with you? Our voices are meant to be joyful, a joyful call to God. We need to shout praises to God. Who was it that had a praise a few minutes ago? Was it you? Annette, listen, Annette had a praise a few minutes ago. Listen, whenever we got praises, we need to shout those praises. We need to let people hear those praises because it is a testimony to what God is doing in somebody's life. So we need to hear about it. We need to shout God's praises. Now, I've read the end of the book. Anybody else? Amen. I've read the end of the book. Guess what? We win. We win. We win. You know, I, I, I got to confess. How many of you know the Bible says confession is good for the soul? I never did like school too much whenever I was growing up. And uh, we'd have to do book reports. Any, you kids still have to do book reports. Y'all have to. Okay, so, so you know, I, we used to have to do book reports. And I just didn't like book reports. I learned to read the first ten pages, the middle ten pages, and the last ten pages. And I could write a report. And I never made no A's, but bless God, I did make C's on them things. I want you to know that. I didn't fail when I was doing book reports. But I didn't read the whole book. The problem with the world today is not everybody's reading the whole book. Amen. You see, this is our GPS for living. It is our roadmap for life. It, it tells us how we need to live. God wants us to get excited about who he is. I can't help myself. I mean, sometimes I get so excited that I... Uh, listen, when I was a younger preacher, I got so excited one time I was in a little church out in A.D. How many of you remember the old church over at Greg's before they built the new church? It was just a little small building. Uh, listen, I, God sent me, I used to preach over there every first and third Sunday afternoon. I did that for several years until, until God blessed and they were able to get a preacher and start having church every Sunday. I'd preach at Ocilla during uh, the early morning service and I'd run to... Uh, to, to Adel out in the Greenwich community and preach every first and third uh, Sunday afternoon. I got so excited one time in that little old church, I struck out to running right down the center aisle. I mean, I was excited for Jesus, and I run slap out the back door. <laughs> and I had to turn around and come back in. We ought to get that excited for Jesus. Man, we can get excited about everything else. We need to get excited for 
for the Lord. And we ought to shout joy uh, and our hearts ought to be filled with joy for the Lord because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now the second word that I want you to see is the word gladness. Look at verse 2. The Bible says serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Now you need to understand that there's a huge difference between gladness and sadness. Did you get that? There's a huge difference. When we come before the Lord, we are to do so with gladness, not sadness. But I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes when I walk into this church, and look into some of your faces, I feel like I might be in a funeral service. <laughs> now, I know some of you are going to be real smart right now and say, well, bless God, if you had to sit out here and look at what we're looking at up there, you'd understand. I know some of you are probably going to say that. But hey, that's all right, too. We ought to come into his presence with gladness. Why? Because my Lord is risen from the dead. My Lord tells me because he's risen from the dead that I need to celebrate that fact. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living no matter what men may say. He is truly alive. He walks with me. He talks with me. He guides me. He directs me. He leads me. Oh, friend, he's alive. And so I ought to come into his presence with gladness. And even if somebody don't like my singing every now and then, I get carried away and start singing. Amen. Bring it on. That's why me and Kathy could go into those rooms where those dear old saints was lying on beds of death. And we could look into their face and them in so much pain. I want Jesus to walk. <laughs> yes, we could, didn't we, sugar? I tell you what, there's so many times that we walked into those homes and those people would lift their heads up off of a deathbed and smile when we'd start singing, I want Jesus to walk with me. Why? Because our hearts were filled with the gladness of the Lord. And theirs were filled with the gladness of the Lord. And they were able to lift their heads off that deathbed. The third word that I want you to see is the word dependence. Look, look at verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we of ourselves. We're his people and the sheep of his pasture. That verse right there shows us the three roles of God. Number one, three roles. Number one, God is Lord. Did you hear that? God is Lord. We are to make him ruler. We are to make him master. And if you please, we are to make him boss of our lives. God is God, and we are not. Now, sometimes we try to live our lives as though we are, but we are not God. God told Moses, he said, I am who I am in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. Beloved, you have no more control over God than you have over the weather. God is God. Amen. Number two, God is the creator. God is the creator. Scientists will try to explain to you how he created. I don't have to explain to you how he created. I just accept the fact that God created. He created. We're uh, his people, and he created us. If you create something, then you're greater than what you created. So you have every right to rule over what you've made. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. Amen. God is creator. Number three, God is shepherd. God is shepherd. We are his people, the Bible says, and the sheep of his pasture. Isn't it amazing that God compares us to sheep? Isn't that amazing? God could have compared us to a bear and said, oh, look how strong they are. God could have compared us to a lion and said, whoa, they're kings and queens. But 
God didn't do that. He compared us to a sheep. You know why God compared us to a sheep? Because sheep needs a shepherd. Sheep needs somebody to lead them. Sheep needs somebody to guide them. Sheep needs somebody to provide for them. Sheep needs somebody to be their security. Sheep needs somebody to help to give them rest. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he yours? Amen. Is he yours? Someone has rightly said, if we are created, then he is creator. If we are sheep, he is shepherd. If we are entering into his courts, then he is king. If I serve him, he is master. If I depend on him, he is God. He created even the air that I breathe. If you don't believe that, just quit breathing. Amen. Let him cut it off for just a few moments. Just let him cut off the air for just a few moments. He'll make a believer out of you. Yes, he will. Did you hear me? He'll make a believer out of you. He knows every hair on your head and those that's not there. Amen. And I'm not pointing, hey, I saw a picture of Dennis on Facebook the other day. You know that boy used to have a head full of hair and it was black. Philip used to have a head full of hair. Hey, I used to have more than I got. Mine's thinner than it used to be. And mine used to be black too. But look how white it is now. Somebody asked me one time, said, Preacher, why did your hair turn white so early in life? Well, it's not early anymore, but it did turn white early. And the fellow that asked me was one who gave me more problems in the church that I pastored than anybody else. And I said, I'll tell you why my hair turned white. Bless God, pastor and Baptist people like you. That'll make your hair turn white. Amen? Amen. Or oh me. Amen. He knows every hair on my head. He knows every beat of my heart. That's what makes him God. I thank him for being God. And listen to me, church. I am dependent on him. Amen. I am. I am dependent on him. Now the fourth word that I want you to see is in uh, verse 4. Notice what it says. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. So the fourth word is the word thankfulness. It says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Listen, thanksgiving is what flows out of a thankful heart. The best biblical illustration that I can give you of this is found in Luke's Gospel, chapter uh, 17. There's an interesting story there. We find that Jesus enters a village. And upon entering that village, he finds ten men who were lepers. They stood a long way off and yelled out, Jesus! Jesus! Have mercy, Jesus, on us! When Jesus saw them, Jesus says, go show yourself to the priest. They turned and they started walking away and did not even realize that they were already cleansed. Already. Headed to show themselves to the priest. And the Bible says as they went along their way that they were cleansed. And you know what happened? One of them realized it. And he turned around and he went back to see Jesus and fell down on his face at the feet of Jesus and glorified God and thanked Jesus for what he had done. Only one out of ten. Where are the nine? You know what? I got a feeling that we're part of those nine. We take thankfulness and thanksgiving for granted. We do. We need to be thankful for everything that God's done for us. The fifth word is the word gratitude. Notice, if you will, verse 5. It says, for the Lord, the Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures. How long? Amen. To all generations. That basically means forever. There are three reasons that you and I need to be grateful. Three reasons. Number one, 
we ought to be grateful because God is good. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Number two, we ought to be grateful because the Lord's mercy is everlasting. Everlasting. And number three, the Lord's truth endures forever. Now there's a lot of people that's trying to steal away the truth of God. They're trying to read into the scripture their own interpretation. And they're trying to make the scripture a, well, they're just making mockery of the scripture. But I had an old seminary professor that taught me this a long time ago, and I've never forgotten it. Quit trying to read stuff into the Bible that's not there. Quit taking scripture out of its context to make it appease your sinful life and appease what you're doing in, in sinful living. And then he said this, the Bible says what it means, and it means what it says. It says what it means, and it means what it says. In Romans chapter 11, Paul is giving thanks and praise to God when he writes these words, basically. Paraphrase a little bit. He said, everything comes from him. Everything comes from him. Everything happens through him. Everything ends up in him. So always glory, always praise. Yes, always praise God. Now, I want you to notice something about Psalm 100. In these short five verses, look at how many times God mentioned, God is mentioned, or God is referred to. Let's read it again, slowly. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the with gladness, come before his presence with singing. Amen. Know ye that the, the Lord, he is, God. it is, he. that has made us and not we ourselves. We are the sheep and uh, we are his, there it is, his, there it is again. Amen. We're his people and the sheep of his, his pasture. Enter into his with thanksgiving and into with praise and be thankful and bless for the Lord is good mercy is everlasting and endure to all generations did you see how many times God is mentioned in that one psalm Barry County 16 times God is mentioned in 5 verses. I would say that the Lord He is God. Amen. This Thanksgiving with all the preparations all of the events all of the excitement. My prayer as your pastor is that God be thanked above all. Amen. That God be thanked above all. And how can we thank him? With joy, Amen. with gladness, Amen. with thankfulness, with gratitude, and with a heart that is always dependent on him. Listen as we close. For without him you can do nothing. I love it when people say to me, Preacher, I don't need your God. I can do things for myself. I always enjoy looking at them and reminding them that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. So if you don't need God, just quit breathing his air. And you'll see just how much you really need God. Stand with me if you will. Father, your word has went forth. I cannot look into the hearts of anyone who is present in this little house of prayer. But where I can't, you can.
Examine us today, Lord, and help us see ourselves, not everybody else, God, but ourselves through your eyes. God, if we don't like what we see, help us do business with the King of kings and Lord of lords because you love us so much that you give us the opportunity to do business with you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You've given us that promise. Now help us accept that and rejoice and be thankful in it. In Jesus' name, amen.